Hi, this is Janice Perkins with Capacity, and I'm joined today by Dr. Daniel Keister, who is the Director of Undergraduate Studies of Economics at Kansas State University. How are you today? I'm uh, doing great, Janice. Just uh, keep on keeping on. That's exactly right. I'm going to try very hard to be more professional and not just call you Keister. Um, Dan and I have a very rich history. Uh, we started college together at Drury University in Springfield, Missouri, and we became good friends because first semester Dan tutored me through Calc 1 <laughs> because we were, what, two of three freshmen with all... I think that's uh, right, yeah. It was not, not uh, we were not advised by the, the best folks as they <laughs> kind of put us out on an island out there with all the juniors and seniors. We were, we were definitely on an island, all juniors and seniors, and, um, and a professor who did not help me understand calculus very well. So that is how I began to rely on you. And I'm going to share my screen just because um, it's nostalgic. There we Very are. Good. So last year we went to a Mizzou game because we're both, of course, fellow Missourians. So um, nobody be a hater in Kansas because we're from Missouri. <laughs> um, don't blame us. And, um, and that's us below. That is probably freshman year, maybe sophomore year. There's really no telling. One or the other. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's it's at the fraternity house, but that doesn't necessarily mean it wasn't freshman year. So I, I don't know. Uh, somebody's room over there at the fraternity house, I, I think. Judging, uh, I did not have that handprint motif self anywhere, and I don't think you did either. So No, I didn't either. I don't know where that's from, but um, my hair is still really big. So that that's just par for the course, and you're still a redhead. Some things never change, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. It's, it's hanging in um, there for a while. Well, I wanted you to join me on the bright side today because I know in economic news, what I understand about it is there's probably not a lot of great news going on, but you have a great way of encapsulating things and helping me understand them. So if you want to give me a two or three minute overview of what's going on today, and then if there's sure. any good news, um, you just okay. do your thing. Yeah, so, uh, you know, generally a thing we, I'm teaching principles uh, as one of my biggest responsibilities right now, and obviously we're trying this as understandable as possible, and I guess a thing that we talk about the most is the circular flow diagram. That's kind of one of your basic things uh, in, in economics, in a market economy, you have different players, you have consumers, you have business, you have, the, you have financial intermediaries, and then you have the rest of the world. And money flows, obviously, from consumers to firms because we buy stuff, right? And uh, the firms generally take most of that money and either pay it to their stockers, dividend owners, or most of it goes out. So about 70% of that money goes back to uh, people and wages. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of like blood through and running through your body or, you know, the, the way an engine works or whatever. And that's pretty gummed up right now. Uh, obviously, there's less spending on the part of consumers, which is problems. And, um, you know, it just becomes kind of stuck in the mud a little bit. And that's kind of unavoidable. I mean, this is not crises like the Great Recession or anything like that. Um, there was really no, no logical way to avoid this, which is why I, as someone who tends to be more of a small government person, um, you know, tends to agree with policies, particularly if we can target those effectively uh, to help small businesses and things like that. And kind of, you know, I, I think there is a real cost here of doing nothing. Uh, I actually think the cost of doing nothing, some of the bigger firms, like the airlines that got some money and things like that could be less harmful than some of the costs uh, with the small firms with the relationship between the business owner and uh, the employees are, you know, more closely tied together in terms of their prosperity. Uh, so again, I mentioned I'd share my screen real quick. There's just a couple things that I think, generally speaking, um, are, are positives. Uh, and if we look at this, this is kind of a nice headline anyway in the Wall Street Journal today. Um, this look at uh, the, the small business loan fund, which was used up Quickly, that's not all on the bright side. You see Shake Shack taking, you know, $10 million or billion or whatever it was, and, you know, probably didn't need the money they got. Uh, you know, so there are some, you know, the government's not perfect. They're going to do some things that are less efficient than we might like. But I would say, generally speaking, in my opinion, 
the $2.2 trillion stimulus was agreed upon pretty much eventually by everybody involved as it probably should have been. Uh, I think the cost of doing nothing because of this gumming up of the system was pretty significant and, and, and would really have some long-term ramifications that are negative. And this, this article, I won't go through it all, but they're just talking about uh, potentially, you know, doing some things to more efficiently and with less paperwork and less maybe uh, the government picking winners and losers is what we had with the first round of small business uh, funds, having more efficient ways of getting money to some of the smaller business owners that, that really need those things. So uh, I would generally say that uh, for government, <laughs> Which is a which is a uh, which is a qualifier. Uh, we've done some appropriate things here, and even with some of the uh, bitterness that's out there, generally speaking, uh, there's been pretty good uh, cooperation to get most of the big ideas across in a way that's uh, I think ultimately beneficial and will reduce some of the costs of this circumstance. So let me ask you then, when you talk about the circular flow diagram. Um, you could talk about it in terms of Kansas. So if Kansas starts to reopen, the governor's supposed to release something next week about how she's going to stair step this out for businesses. Um, in that engine kind of um, analogy, when you release the, the dam pressure or whatever it is, you know, right. that, um, that enables it to start flowing again, is there a backlog? Is there an overflow? I mean, is it still systematically wobbly for a couple of weeks until things align? Yes, I, I think, you know, eventually, you know, if you look at the one of the greatest periods of prosperity in the United States, you look at after World War II, mm -hmm. because you had all this pent up demand and right. people willing to work. And so you had the combination of output being produced and then people buying stuff. It's not enough to just give people money eventually, right? <laughs> like the economy right. is about stuff. Like Adam Smith talked about money is not wealth wealth is goods and services so we have to eventually get back to actually producing things now like you're doing things that are in the services industry which is the most dynamic part of the economy and it's difficult to measure you know intellectual um capacity or intellectual contributions but they're real and they're they're meaningful uh so there's a lot of that in our economy we can do more of that virtually than we ever could uh but at the same time we still, you know, and, and so we kind of overestimate the importance of making cars and things like that. Right. We still want to make things. We want to be doing things. Right. And as this economy gets kind of brought back slowly, uh, there will be some pent up demand for certain things. There's no doubt about that. But that won't be overwhelming in the macro sense. And I say macro even for the state of Kansas, like the overall economy, mm -hmm. until we get you know, more things up and running in the entire, every kind of facet of the economy or most facets of the economy, you know, back to being um, you know, relatively fully employed. Well, and when you look at that, as you stand backward even farther than like the state of Kansas, because each state is going to be coming back online at a different pace based right. on their hotspots or their governors. And then you look at the global market. So each country. So there's going to be probably some really weird, odd, ebb and flow to that pent-up demand in places and the release because there are supplies that you can't get from certain places or distribution channels or whatever it is. I feel like, you know, like you're talking about comparing it to World War II, it was, it was an open gate day. Um, and this is going to be more erratic on the way out. Yeah, there's no doubt the, the supply chain disruptions are going to uh, change individual markets pretty dramatically and certainly you're going to see more where you can get away with it local markets uh but this is kind of a side effect you know we still in my opinion don't want the tariffs that we've been implementing uh, and they're not as severe as people make them out to bring the things in the overall effect of the economy but uh you know then we may choose to buy certain items from different locations than we have before based on geopolitical stuff and things like that. And I think there, there's some logic behind that. But um, you're going to see certain industries that can get away with producing more things locally, I think, do that. Uh, if they can do it at a competitive, um, a competitive you know, price point and things like that. So we will see more local and regional economies. Uh, we'll see certainly certain industries um, you know, grow. 
while other industries that were kind of, you know, brick and mortar retail wasn't doing the best already. Dynamic outcome uh, okay. that, you know, make you think back to uh, Joseph Schumpeter and Creative Destruction. And he talked about that was the uh, driving force for a lot of economic activity. And you will have some of that. You will have new distribution channels. You'll have new markets. You'll have new products in some cases. Uh, and those things generally are good, but what we don't want to do is I hear some people, I had a, a buddy email me today and say, isn't this really going to turn out? Uh, because we're going to have, and I'm like, you know, if you go back to Frederick Bastia and the fallacy, the broken window, not off because things kind of went in the ditch for a while. And now you'd rather just keep moving, you know, down the road in a good way. But given that, there is a potential for uh, some, some dynamic, I won't try to say the other word, uh, outcomes and uh, some positive growth there. No, I love hearing you say that. And um, you know, you just probably made all kinds of economic people tinge with delight at all the name dropping you did that I have no idea who these people are. Um, this is why I appreciate your intellect. Um, I want you to speak also, when you talked about like post-World War II, I mean, one of the things that I feel is probably um, unmeasurable at this point, and I'm excited to see. I feel like because of the the, the shelter in place dynamic versus just economic, you know, issues from a war or a recession or something like that, that we have this pent up innovation that's going to explode in a way that economically is unpredictable, but is to me the bright side coming that we that we can't predict. Absolutely, and. Um that's yeah that's immeasurable at this point i mean you know we you know we lived through the internet right and you saw how that fundamentally changed everything in terms of productivity and you know we were going through that i mean as, as college student and then in grad school in my case you know just the ability to access data uh so dramatically in a small relatively at the time while i was going through my research and doing my dissertation and all that. And so, you know, people always wonder what's the next internet going to be. Uh, having this type of, you know, time to think about these things and, you know, certain people doing what we're doing and getting together virtually, if not person, and collaborating on things, uh, I think there is some potential there for some innovative things we may not be able to imagine. Um, so that's certainly true. And again, there will be opportunities for the right type of business to step into these new supply chains that are going to happen. Right. And uh, it's just being, you know, nimble in how you uh, approach that. Well, and I, I just have to correct you. I, I didn't mean 30 years ago we were in college together. It was like 15 years ago. I don't know what you're talking about with this internet thing. We're, <laughs> we're ripe and young. <laughs> there, you, there you go. I'm doing the math here. It's not been 30. So let's stick with that. Uh, let's stick I with was, that. Yeah. So, so on that note, I want you to shift because um, people who don't know you very well don't know that you're also an avid sports fan and you are a walking encyclopedia of current knowledge of what's going on in, in every aspect of sports, uh, which is always interesting to myself and my teenage son. So why don't you tell me what is on the bright side going on in the world of sports? Well, uh, I guess, honestly, I think to a large degree, uh, what's been going on that's on the bright side is the restraint uh, because there has been, you know, I remember when the, um, you know, the Big 12 basketball tournament and the, as a Missouri guy, the SEC basketball tournament, I was all fired up to watch that on that particular Thursday, I guess. I think March 12th was the exact date and everything just kind of shut down over the course of a few hours. And this was after uh, the Utah Jazz player correct, uh, contacted the virus for the NBA, and they shut down, and they kind of went away, and then everybody uh, followed suit. So I think, generally speaking, um, that was probably something that helped all of us think this is different mm -hmm. and take the kind of actions uh, that needed to be taken. And you can see my Patrick Mahomes jersey here in the background. Uh, not only was it so great that the Chiefs won the Super Bowl, but there's a there's a great article in the Wall Street Journal. Did you see? Yeah, all right. <laughs> Look you. Um, there was a great article in the Wall Street Journal about how many people probably uh, would have 
you know, suffered from the virus because the, 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 um, in San Francisco, it was so much further along when the parades were happening than it would have been in Kansas. I did that with my students and talked about it a little bit of, you know, uh, a happy coincidence, not only because the Chiefs won, but, you know, the, 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 obviously the human effect was much greater than that. So I think that they've been responsible uh, largely uh, about doing this. There's been some criticism of not really a sport for us entertainment because they're shooting shows in Florida uh, right now and they got a approval from the governor, which seems a little shit uh, at first, but, you know, usually lag behind other other uh, other sports entities in terms of being good corporate folks anyway, uh, in my opinion. That, that's just a normative statement, so don't sue me over it. Um, but, uh, you know, I do think that the idea of baseball in Arizona uh, in a very strictly quarantined um, uh, atmosphere for at least like a month, I, I think that, and maybe it'll be four months, but I think at some point you have to uh, at least not, set that out where it's all necessarily going to be four months, kind of see where the data goes. Uh, I think that's possible and promising. There's been talks of the NHL uh, having games mostly in North Dakota, I guess, uh, which I think is promising. I'm less excited about seeing uh, so much live work, work with WWE and UFC uh, is going to promote eventually live shows, which – you know, from a safety perspective, I'm a little bit less uh, excited about. But I think that the sports leagues have been, uh, you know, mature about this and looking kind of at the long-term uh, health of their their fan and their uh, participants. And, um, you know, I do suspect we will start. I think golf's definitely coming back uh, in about six to seven weeks, I think middle of June. And, you know, golf is obviously a sport that if you're going to have a sport going on right now, that's probably the safest one in terms of social distancing and, mm -hmm. and um, you know, the number of people it requires to have this. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that the idea that, that some of these leagues are looking to move forward, and NBA is talking about obviously locating in Vegas. I don't know if I mentioned that, I mean, quarantining everybody, and, and there should be the space to do that. And they've actually – they have experience with the G League of having games with no, basically no fans, very few invited guests. So they may uh, get up and running uh, pretty quickly. And so uh, I think that they're taking a measured and reasoned approach to this um, is, is good news. And I think that uh, there is potential for some sports to come back, you know, in the months to come, uh, you know, months plural, uh, as opposed to a few weeks probably. But uh, I think that's somewhat promising. I think college athletics, in all likelihood, um, you know, I'd be surprised to see anything really develop too much in college athletics until 2021. But but we'll see about it. I mean, but there's been discussion of having college football in the spring, and I think that's at least potentially a reasonable plan, uh, shorten the season and, and um, you know, kind of see where we're at at that point. No, I, I really like the word you used, restraint um, and maturity. You used both of those words, and I do find that that surprised me. And it really did set the tone for um, our social interactions and to take it seriously versus just a governor order or a, you know, a county commissioner order. Um, I, I think that it was um, very well heated. You know, all the rest of entertainment followed with concerts and things very quickly. Um, I, I do, because I don't understand how all of that works. I have wondered specifically, I have friends whose, you know, their kids are graduating high school this year. They've been looked at for sports. What happens with getting picked up for um, college athletics if you are on the cusp leaving high school? Um, how, you know, if the numbers really drop off and we're on the backside of the bell curve faster than we think um, with the virus, um, how fast can they um, pivot and start sooner? I mean, what, what, is there a permanent delay no matter what? That's the question. Right. And again, those are kind of more medical questions, I guess, than I really want to give too much of an opinion on to be, you know, act like I know something I don't. Um, we are seeing in college athletics, I know at Missouri, uh, the, the, uh, the big money people are taking a 10% pay cut, at least for a few months, which is, 
you know, something. Um, Boise State is furloughing their coaches, actually, uh, for a short period of time uh, to save money. So some of the, you know, the, the money in college athletics, uh, Kansas State's athletic budget is right around $90 million a year. And when I started working here, if I had to guess, I'd say it was below $30 million. If it wasn't, it wasn't much over 30 So I find it, you know, hard to accept that these schools need the type of money they have to operate efficiently uh, athletic budgets. But that money's all gone into facilities, coaches' salary. Facilities is usually off budget, actually, but coaches' salaries, administration, right. um, and perks for student athletes. That's part of it, but it's not enough of it, in my opinion, uh, by any means. So uh, I'm starting to ramble. To answer your question, if you're a star athlete, that you know, Wichita State wants or um, Kansas State wants or somebody like that in, in, a, in, in a money sport, you know, college football and men's basketball, you're going to be fine. And you're probably going to be fine if you're in kind of a, a sport that is accounted for, such as, uh, you know, women's basketball or something like that. Some of these schools will try to use this as a reason to shut down some non-revenue sports. Uh, which I find very upsetting and disturbing. Um, if you are an athlete at, say, an NAIA school, uh, the odds are this is not the time they're going to be cutting scholarships to athletes because everybody's looking for students right now, right? And so that's like one of those that's things fair. that uh, at that environment, you're providing some, yes, there are scholarships to have, some ability to pay for that, and then, you know, you'd be cutting off your nose to spite your face. It's the people that are kind of in between. Like, if you're going into a big-time wrestling program or baseball, even at some colleges, uh, I might be a little less certain about how the funding is going to hold up for the next four years. Because even though I think these schools can easily maintain all the sports they have and just cut salaries, basically, um, you know, that's difficult to do uh you know given the the nature of everybody wants to put puts all their money into football and men's basketball because those are the ones that they think are the biggest money generators and i think to some degree they lose sight of what college athlete athletics is uh, allegedly about so uh there are some positives but there are also some concerns on the horizon there no i appreciate the summary that helps me get a good picture too because i don't i don't pay attention to the news as much as you do to know what's going on what the whispers are um, uh, before we close, I want you to tell me what's your personal on the bright side in all of this? Yeah, um, you know, there's been quite a few things. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've seen a lot of acts of kindness and, and looking out for each other and, and that's all really exciting. But, I, you know, I'm really fortunate uh, to work where I work and do what I do. Uh, to be here at K-State, you know, I'm giving my first online exam tonight, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, trying to admit it live to a group of 200 students or as many of them as can participate. But the willingness to meet me more than halfway in all my classes has really been great. Um, you know, we've tried to be as dynamic as we can uh, to meet with students. And like, I'm going to teach my class this summer. Uh, it's gonna be obviously online as opposed to it was supposed to be in person. And I reached out to my students and said, what do you want to do? How do we want to address this? Because we're supposed to meet five days a week for six weeks. And they want to have a lot of live meetings. Not every day, but I kind of thought they might not want to. And so there's been this real um, willingness to learn. There's been this real, um, you know, people aren't afraid to contribute, whether it be on the chat or asking questions or kind of steering me in the right direction, giving me feedback. And, you know, we really have a group of students here that are, you know, you things about, oh, the, you know, college kids today and blah, blah, blah. And, and that's just not what I experience at all. I get so many positive, and we're lucky. I mean, we get these kids, and for the most part, you know, they really have been taught certain things, and they have a certain uh, way of looking at the world that tends to be really positive. But I've been just really pleased having the opportunity to work with these students and have them, you know, over and over kind of either express concerns that are very legitimate and almost undersell those concerns where you're like, no, no, this is something we can, we can work with and we can try to get you some aid 
or just going, you know, with more effort to, to keep learning and keep uh, having a great environment than, than you might expect. I was pretty apprehensive about teaching online. I'm not the Zoom guy, or at least I'm still not, but I certainly wasn't a few weeks ago by any means. And uh, it's gone far better than I feared and expected. So uh, I just, you know, I, I really, it's the students that, uh, that, have, that have meant the most to me, even though there's also been some, you know, our teaching center here at K-State has been great, super supportive. Uh, and I feel like, you know, we'll come together with this as a university and, and uh, come out on, it on the other side pretty well. Um, I really love hearing that. Um, uh, congratulations to um, your viewpoint of the world, by the way. That's one of the reasons I admire you. You are very positive and you see the good in people. Um, and I have to brag on you for a minute, too, because we run into some of your students before and you're kind of famous. Um, I'm not sure for anyone who sees this, who has students who might go to K-State someday or who are there and, and maybe don't need to take um, econ, really should take your, your class. Because one of the things you're famous for is, um, is using the Office TV show in your economics class. But, you know, just really pulling people into the idea of econ um, in real world examples um, that make you an... Uh, a unique person that I know you to be. And um, so why don't you speak about uh, briefly what you do in class sometimes to give, give yourself a little, a little ditty. Oh my gosh. Well, I mean, every day, uh, as Bill Roth did, did you take Roth at Drury? No. Okay, so you probably just had Mullins, yeah. But Bill Roth would come into the class and good morning economists, except he'd jump up on the table out good morning economist everybody so i start every day like that and then ask if everybody's happy just like uh, bill rolf who got his phd here at k-state by the way so it kind of comes full circle and so we try to you know music or class we try to you know start the class off with energy uh, we do show a lot of these uh office videos usually they're about a minute long but they're about some economic concept that we can uh hopefully relate to and uh you know pretty pretty cool stuff i think um, and so that's something that we, uh, that we have a lot of fun with. And I'm continuing to incorporate the videos into some of my lectures, even though they're, that are pre-recorded or whatever. And, uh, obviously with streaming, we have mixed results with that, but I think the students appreciate it for the most part. And so we'll give the video and it's not just watch this video. Uh, it's like, Hey, Dwight sold these princess unicorn dolls for 200 bucks a pop. Why did he do that? What's unique about the supply of these things? What happened to the demand curve? Think, pair, share, partner up with somebody, write this out, we'll grade it by hand and we'll talk about it next class period. And so we try to do those dynamic things in as many lectures as we can. And usually about halfway through the lecture, just to keep people on their toes and keep people uh, paying attention because um, you know, uh, that's, that's you know, no exciting for 50 minutes if it's very, you know, the old Ben Stein, Bueller, Bueller guy, uh, that doesn't work. And so, uh, yeah, we, we try to, we try to make it exciting and, uh, you know, and I'm a big guy. I don't know how easily that comes across here in the video, but so people, you know, I have, I'm a big guy with terrible vision, Janice. So I'll see people, but they'll see me, Keister. And I'm like, can't quite see this person. And if I could, I teach a thousand students a year. Uh, so I always feel a little bad. I'm like, you know, not remember. I remember a lot of names. I do pretty well with it, particularly if like you're in my class right now, that's kind of in the front of my brain. But uh, there's a lot of, there are too many times I get uh, faces, not names. And I always, but I usually just, ask, again, our students are so polite. They, they don't take offense to that. So it's. Uh, that's it's right. You're the, you're the unforgettable, really tall red head with the deep booming voice in the crowd. So yeah, hard to. I'm hard easily to spotted. For better or for worse, I'm not. I'm not the guy to uh, do anything clandestine uh, with. Probably so no, no. It's a good thing you try to be a spy. It's a good thing you're. you're. We really make the most of uh, of teaching the big classes here. I've worked with a few people that are very creative. Uh, my buddy Dirk Material. I'll, I'll shout out to him. Uh, you know, we work together on that. Economicsoftheoffice.com, by the way, if you want to see the website. And yep. most of those clips were ones I came up with originally, but uh, Dirk helped me, you know, facilitate that. And he he contributed some of the clips as well. And he's been he's had his finger in all sorts of things like that. And is is always creative, always full of good ideas. And I've met some great people in the discipline that are passionate about 
uh, teaching students that are full of good ideas. So it's, it's uh, I, I've been very fortunate in that regard. Well, you know, my opinion is they're fortunate to have you. I have always been a big fan, Dr. Dan Keister at Kansas State University. And I am so glad I got to talk to you again this far away um, via screen. Thank you for joining me today on The Bright Side. Thanks for having me, Janice.